Honourable Senator, Senator McKim has submitted a proposal under Standing Order 75 today. It is shown at item 12 on today's order of business. Is the proposal supported? Can you wave your arm around, Jordan? Thank you. I note the requisite support has been indicated. I understand that informal arrangements have been made to allocate specific times to each of the speakers in today's debate. With the concurrence of the Senate, I ask the clerks to set the clock accordingly. Senator McKim. Uh, thank you very much, Deputy President. Well, we are witnessing something extraordinary and devastating unfolding in this country. The lives of the poorest Australians, those can least, who can least afford to be made worse off, are being degraded in the relentless and dogmatic pursuit of a self-defeating economic goal. Renters and mortgage holders are being smashed by a reserve bank stuck in the past and in denial of reality. Tomorrow will be just the latest chapter of this unfolding ruination of the poorest Australians when the RBA does what it shouldn't do and lifts interest rates for the tenth consecutive time. And meanwhile, the government is more interested in ashen-faced commentary rather than doing what it was elected to do, which is actually to help people. We find ourselves, and we will find ourselves tomorrow, at the dead end of neoliberal economics. And at that dead end lies the inherent flaw in one of the hallmarks of this corrupt ideology, so-called independent central banking. Independent central banking is fundamentally undemocratic. The justification for one of the most important economic tools not being in the hands of elected government is that monetary policy is too important to be left to politics. We are told that interest rate decisions are best left to those who really understand the economy and that inflation is always and everywhere a function of excessive demand, that the RBA alone should be left to get under control. It's on this reductive logic that the RBA's nine consecutive rate rises have been based and gone unchallenged by the government. And it's on this reductive logic that tomorrow's tenth interest rate rise will again be based. But the logic is flawed. How do we know it's flawed? Well, because the RBA have told us so. Last month, the RBA said that between half and three quarters of the increase in inflation is a result of supply shocks. And the chair of the board of the RBA, Mr Lowe, said that, and I quote, there is very little that monetary policy can do to offset supply shocks. And again, he said, and I quote again, our models are not well suited for supply shocks. So there it is. Our glorious, technocratic, wise above all others, independent central bank, responding to a problem it can't understand with a solution that doesn't suit. And that's the great travesty happening before our eyes. We know interest rates are not the right tool to deal with the current inflation spike, but we are stuck in this bizarre Pavlovian state where the RBA raises interest rates to squash a non-existent price wage spiral and the government goes through its oh, nothing we can do about it routine and the poorest Australians, the renters and mortgage holders of this country who did nothing to create the problem of spiking inflation are paying the price. And we're supposed to believe that this is the best we can do while the wealthiest in this country continue to make off like bandits. Well, it's not good enough. And I say to Labor, people's lives are being destroyed. So wake up, 
and do something about it. Tax corporate super profits. Tax the wealthy. Freeze rents. Make childcare free. Put dental and mental health into Medicare and raise income support. These are meaningful actions that Labor could do if they would just take their heads out of their centrist fundaments and look to the light on the hill. Please do something. Don't just sit there and pretend you Senator can't. Rennick. Acting Madam Deputy President, and it must be a blue moon tonight because it's not often I uh, agree with Senator McKim uh, on most of his motion. I'm not too keen on the uh, national freeze on rents, uh, even though I accept it's a genuine problem there in regards to the rents. Um, but much, much more needs to be done than just allowing an unelected and an unaccountable uh, RBA to run right and destroy the economy, destroy the economy through this blunt instrument known as quali qualitative easing. For too long, Western governments have relied on these central bankers who are unaccountable, who are all, reported to, uh, all report to the International Bank of Settlements, and we've had that confirmed by Michelle Bullock in the last set of estimates where she admitted she wouldn't release the minutes uh, of those meetings with the International Bank of Settlements because they wouldn't be allowed back at the table. I mean, that's not what I call accountability. But I'll address that issue on another day. I want to go back to the crux of this, which, of course, is the cost of living and the crisis that is going to be caused by the RBA's reckless behaviour. Reckless behaviour. And the problem with the RBA is that they are all lifers. The last four RBA governors all started work at the RBA. They've all had careers in the RBA, and they have no idea of what goes on in the real world. They are theor uh, uh, you know, theoretically, uh, they base everything on theory and very, very little on practice. And uh, I think that we need to look at, and I know that Senator Kim was touching on this, I didn't quite pick up all of it, but I think I'm on the same path as him. You know, they only deal with, and I've asked the RBA this myself, they only deal with the demand side. Right? What we've got here in Australia at the moment is, is that we've had supply shocks. So people often think that inflation is caused only by too much demand. That's not the case. And you know, if too much demand is trying to make ends meet, well, I'm sorry, but that's not too much demand. That's a lack of productivity in our own economy because we don't build enough nation-building infrastructure to actually provide essential services at affordable rates. And what we really need to do in this country is stop being afraid of building infrastructure, in particular what I call the Sovereign Seven, which are dams, uh, rail, road, power stations, telecommunications, um, and airports and ports. And those are the things that if we supply more of those things through quantitative easing, through quantitative easing, and now everyone, you know, I was brainwashed. It took me 30 years to unbrainwash myself because I had this rubbish forced down my throat at university. There is nothing wrong. We see companies do it all the time. They issue shares, they issue equity, they issue new equity to build a new mine. As a country, we can issue new equity to build infrastructure. It's debit asset, credit equity. Or if you want to call it, you can create an infrastructure banks uh, here at the federal government level, and they can lend to the state governments, and then the state governments pay interest back interest back to the National Infrastructure Bank and then the National Infrastructure Bank can pay dividends back through to the federal government, which will basically be a form of raising revenue, adding more infrastructure and more supply to the economy, which will push down the prices of essential services. And that's not just good for the cost of living, that will make it more competitive for our businesses to compete with other businesses in the world. Now, if you look at China, for example, they didn't go out and borrow billions and billions of dollars or trillions and trillions of dollars in US dollars. They actually did all that infrastructure building in China on the back of their own central bank. And should I add, we have a history here in Australia of doing the same thing. Uh, one of Australia's first governors, and he was the first governor to issue his own, our own currency, was Lachlan Macquarie. He built the Sydney Hospital, the Sydney Barracks, he, with our own currency the holy dollar. That was Australia's first currency. Unfortunately, today, that holy dollar is used as the logo for Macquarie Bank, who happened to actually act on 
because of superannuation, and this is what people don't want to admit about superannuation, is the fact that that facilitated the privatisation of our infrastructure assets. So that now that they're in the hands of unelected uh, superannuation board me uh, members. But can I just say though, there's other things we can do to ease demand uh, in, on inflation, and that is we should look at lowering the immigration rate. Now, most of our immigration, two thirds of our immigration rate, is driven by foreign students, and these foreign students, the universities, don't actually have to pay tax on the income derived by foreign students. So, if you want to talk about a super profits tax, let's make universities uh, pay tax on the profits they derive from foreign students that will reduce the demand caused by over-immigration. Senator Walsh. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. And I, too, rise to speak on the urgency motion uh, moved by Senator McKim. Uh, and the Albanese government is talking to Australians every day, uh, and we know that Australians are facing cost of living challenges. Um, we know that families are doing it tough. Um, we hear it every day. Uh, and after a decade of waste and rorts uh, and stagnant low wages, a pandemic and the war in Ukraine, um, inflation is quite appropriately the top issue on our agenda. The Reserve Bank makes its decisions independently uh, in its response to addressing inflation. Um, and uh, it should stay independent. Uh, and I think today's debate really shows exactly how important it is that the RBA sets rates, not politicians and not the politicians in this chamber. Um, our role as the government is to deliver a responsible economic plan uh, and to deliver relief to those who need it most, um, because it is a responsible plan that will help drive down inflation. Uh, and because of a decade of the former coalition government's wasted opportunities and their questionable priorities, um, we have a lot of work to do. We're dealing with a trillion dollars of debt uh, with absolutely nothing to show for it. So our response to inflation um, is our three-point plan. And our plan is about relief, repair and, importantly, restraint as well. We're providing cost of living relief that doesn't add to inflation. Um, this year, we've successfully argued for a minimum wage increase, and we're proud of that increase. Yeah. We've delivered cheaper medicines, which has seen Australians saving more than 36 million in the last two months. We know energy bills are a stress point for households, so we're working with the states and territories to provide energy bill relief, uh, and this will be a key policy in the May budget. Last December, we introduced emergency caps on gas prices, uh, and it's been confirmed in Senate estimates that this will push down future prices significantly. Um, according to Dr Kennedy, over the year to June 2024, our price caps will continue to reduce inflation by half a per cent. Uh, and this is also a point acknowledged by Mr Lowe, who cited in estimates our energy policy as a key downward force on inflation. Mm -hmm. Uh, and we know people need relief from the rise of rising cost of living today as well, right now, today. So we're delivering cheaper childcare, we're delivering free TAFE, we're expanding paid parental leave, we're building more homes. Uh, and at the same time, we're repairing our economy. Uh, and Senator McKim does raise an important point. Um, it is supply chocks that that have contributed to inflation. Uh, and the coalition did nothing in government to strengthen our supply chains. Uh, and that's only made things worse for Australian families. Um, we have plans to repair our broken supply chains. We're doing that by investing in the long run of our economy. Our $15 billion National Reconstruction Fund will diversify our economy. It'll bring manufacturing back to our shores. It'll create secure, well-paid jobs. And we're investing in the renewables that will bring down energy prices as well and help us reach our emission targets too. So what is important right now is that as a government we make quality investments, quality investments that strengthen and diversify our economy, that secure our energy uh, and our supply chains and create new jobs across the economy. Now, notably, our plans don't add to inflation. Uh, and that's because we're being responsible and restraining our spending. Uh, 
We're returning 99 per cent of revenue upgrades to the budget over the next two years. The average of the last government was just 40 per cent. So the last thing that we want to be doing is contributing to inflation pressures. The plan is working and we need to stick to it. We know that Australians are doing it tough and we're taking responsibility for uh, addressing inflation. It is the defining challenge that we face right now this year, but we're prepared to face it with sensible plans. We're working every day to make Australians' lives better by delivering secure jobs, cheaper childcare, cheaper medicines and investing in the long run of our nation with more housing, cleaner energy and bringing back manufacturing. This is what we were elected to do and we're getting on with the job. Senator Roberts. Senator Roberts, sorry, I, I, you didn't Thank you. hear me give you the call I had done. So. As a servant to the many different people making our amazing Queensland community, rental prices are a savage problem. Interest rate rises are increasing mortgage repayments and forcing more investment property owners to dip into their own pockets to pay their mortgage. If owners do not have that extra money, then negative gearing is not going to help. Inflation of 7.8 per cent means council rates, water rates, maintenance costs and insurance are making it harder and harder to hang on to investment properties. And now the Greens propose a rent freeze, which is really a 7.8 per cent rent reduction each year that it goes on. The only effect of a rental freeze will be to drive investment property owners out of the market. Australia needs investment property owners to provide a home to people who are renting. Driving them out of the market will hurt the 400,000 new Australians who arrived last year and the one million likely to arrive during the course of this government. Rising rentals are a product of too many people chasing too few rentals. We know 10 per cent of Australian homes are owned by investors who are, who are renting them, not renting them out. Their investment strategy is to buy a new home and keep it locked up while it appreciates in value. Having a tenant in there is a complication they don't want and lowers the resale value because the home is no longer new. Most of these properties are foreign owners. One Nation would give these owners 12 months to sell those properties to Australians. Bringing that number of homes onto the market will do more to bring prices down than a price cap. And One Nation will reduce immigration to net zero, meaning only enough arrivals arrive each year to replace those that leave. This will allow time for the housing construction industry to catch up with demand. It is about supply and demand. These are sensible, honest policies that are One Nation solutions to high rents that will protect real estate values from the chaos a rental cap will introduce. Senator O'Neill. Uh, thank you very much, Acting Dep Deputy President. I rise today to speak to the urgency motion put forward by Senator McKimmon. Once we have, again, we have to contend with the Greens political party a uh, range of fantasies about the way in which the economy operates. Uh, Labor believes in real solutions for all Australians, not dramatic and impractical action. We need to use an evidence base, and evidence shows that rental freezes simply don't work. Uh, yet that is uh, one of the profferings from Senator McKim here for consideration by the Senate, and it should be rejected. To Australians, I say the Reserve Bank is independent. And it's at arm's length from government. There's a reason it was constructed that way, and it remains so. But that doesn't mean that, as a government, we don't understand what's happening for real Australians. We understand that both renters and mortgage holders are feeling the pain right now. They're feeling it, absolutely. And that's why we'll focus on real solutions, not fantasies in another world that doesn't exist, real solutions to address the real concerns of Australia in a fiscally responsible way. Re regulation of residential tenancies is frankly not a matter for federal governments, it's a matter for state and territory governments, and the Commonwealth can't actually even require those governments to freeze rents. So the motion falls over completely on its face just with that one point. In contrast, Labor is absolutely focusing on increasing the supply of new houses in the market, helping to increase supply through our $10 billion Housing Australia Future Fund which will deliver 30,000 new homes in the first five years alone. Now, the Future Fund is only one part of our very ambitious and much-needed reform agenda to make up for nine lost years under the Liberal National Party. 
We are striking a new national housing accord between all levels of government, investors and industry, to build affordable homes our country really, really needs. We need to boost the supply of new houses. We are widening the National Housing Infrastructure Facility, with up to $575 million available to invest in more social and affordable homes right across the country, with many projects already announced. The Regional First Home Buyer Guarantee was brought forward by three months. More than 2,000 places have already been taken up with hundreds of Australian families now in their new homes. Practical outcomes. That's what people need, not pie in the sky, muck it up as you go, see if you can get a headline on the way through. Help to Buy, a new program brought forward by the Albanese government, is here to help Australians get their own home sooner, establishing a permanent national housing supply and affordability council. Hard to believe that there wasn't one, but there wasn't. For nine long years, this whole space has been profoundly neglected. Now, the interim council that we've established as a Labor government coming in under Prime Minister Albanese has been operating uh, as an interim council since the 1st of January, providing independent expert advice to government. We're also developing a national housing and homelessness plan because everybody knows that that is at crisis point in our country. Now, the gentrified Greens over there in the corner um, so often appear to be NIMBYs never seen an affordable housing or social project that they haven't opposed. Now, in my very own home state of New South Wales, the Greens candidate for Balmain, the outgoing MP, campaigned against a plan for a mere six apartments. Six apartments. And the Greens opposed it. Three of them were designated as affordable housing. This, uh, the side of it is 180 Darling Street in Balmain. To the Greens, one new affordable housing built apartment is like a disaster. One new home to a middle or working class family is one entirely too many. Well, I come in here with ideas that are absolutely implausible and impractical. They're out of touch. Now, the Greens political party need to understand that increased supply will drive down prices. And if that political party with a Green in front of it was actually caring about reducing rents and prices for councillors, uh, they, they'd actually cared about reducing rents and prices. Their councillors and candidates across Australia would stop opposing reasonable new property developments. They have to be reasonable, but there's got to be new stock built. You can't just stop everything. You just can't do it. Inflation is a worldwide problem caused by Russia's illegal invasion of Ukraine. Supply chains are strained by war and global pandemics. We've got to get inflation under control, and we're helping with cost of living, childcare, medicines, direct energy bill relief, minimum wage rise, and fee-free TAFE. That's real. That's practical. That's Labor. That's Australia's government. Senator. Shoebridge. Uh, thank you, Acting uh, Deputy President. Every single day that goes by without subsidising skyrocketing energy bills, without raising wages, without effectively dealing with the housing crisis, without stabilising interest rates, this government from the Labor political party is choosing poverty for millions of people across the country. Poverty is a political choice, and it's a choice that this government, the Labor political party, is making each day. While corporate profits hit record numbers, there are more than half a million people languishing on the social housing waitlist across the country. And while there are five and a half million people relying on Centrelink payments below the poverty line, and this government is deciding to give $240 -odd billion in tax breaks to the super wealthy. And while even, 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 even standing up while people in this place are about to pocket an extra $9,000 a year in tax cuts. What, and, and they accept that wages for ordinary people and, and ordinary people's living standards are going backwards. And tomorrow, when the RBA raises interest rates again, the Labor political party will cry crocodile tears and say there's nothing they can do. That is a surrender of political leadership, and it's entrenching intergenerational disadvantage. And in, in my hometown of Sydney, we've seen property and rental prices at historic highs. Young people in particular are suffering, and we've seen the Labor Party get into bed with property developers every time they're in government and never address affordable housing. There's never been a property developer that the New South Wales Labor Party hasn't loved, and it's never, ever succeeded in providing housing for the people who need it. And the data shows that in Sydney, 
from Palm Beach to Cronulla, across the Balkan Hills, you actually need to earn $100,000 a year just to avoid housing stress. And it's obscenely common for people to be getting $100, $200 or $300 a week rental increases. No one, no one is getting a pay rise of that magnitude. But of course, some uber-rich people are going to be offered tax breaks even greater than that by the Labor political party. We should step in and support much-needed rent freezes. It's a simple, achievable and meaning step to hit pause on the cost of living crisis. Just press pause on it. I've been out at Addison Road Food Pantry in Marrickville in the heart of Sydney and seen just how many people are coming in asking for help with putting food on the table right now. It's going to get worse tomorrow. They know, those people know that they can rely on their community to pitch in and they should expect their government to do, to, to do the same. I've joined with Turbans for Australia out in Clyde at their warehouse where they provide food for those who need it because of the policy failures of federal and state governments. They are taking the time to understand the real cost of living crisis. And if you say you care about support, supporting those who are doing it tough, then you need to step up on delivering that. And this Labor political party needs to deliver policies that help the people most in need. Senator Orman Payne. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Australians continue to suffer in a cost of living crisis caused by corporate profits. Yet the RBA, aided and abetted by the Labor political party, continue to kick the teeth of workers by jacking up interest rates. Right. We now have fresh evidence that inflation above the target rate is being driven largely by corporate profiteering. The RBA knows this, and the government knows this too. And yet again, working Australians are being pummeled by the blunt tool of monetary policy being forced to suffer for the inflation that they are not causing. The government is delighted to be able to keep the RBA's interest rate rises at arm's length, but the government is also to blame for the cost of living crisis Australians have found themselves in through no fault of their own. We've seen time and time again a government unwilling to take meaningful action on cost of living relief. What we don't need are useless platitudes. What we need is a government brave enough to actually make policy decisions. We need to reverse the atrocious quarter of a trillion dollars worth of tax cuts for the super rich. We need an immediate rent freeze and we need public education that is truly free. If Labor scrapped their stage three tax cuts, we could fund real cost of living relief. We could have a two-year freeze on rents, and then we could cap rent hikes at 2 per cent for 24 months. It's been done in Victoria, British Columbia, New York and Germany. Let's do that here too and give real meaningful cost of living relief to Australians. We could make public education truly, fit, truly free. We've seen the exorbitant costs that even parents of students in public schools are having to pay for their child's education. And we're hearing how high university students are getting smashed by student debt and people trying to pay off hex bills are having that eat into their income. Of the $243.5 billion of Labor's stage three tax cuts, 188 billion, or 77 per cent of the benefit, will go to the wealthiest 20 per cent of the population. Even worse, you're giving the richest 1 per cent as much as the bottom 65 per cent. Australians deserve a government that's serious about cost of living, that abolishes tax cuts for the rich. Senator Hanson Young. Thank you. Well, we are in the midst of the cost of living crisis in this country, and we hear day after day after day of the struggles of everyday people to afford rent, to afford their hike in mortgage repayments, to put food on their table and to buy uniforms at the beginning of the year for their kids. And yet, here uh, in Canberra, the government is overseeing two of the government's biggest government owned corporations, Australia Post and NBN Co, whose executives, who this year alone have banked over half a million dollars in bonuses. The CEO of 
Australia Post, $2 million. Salary, over half a million dollars in bonuses. We know that the CEO of MBN Co, Stephen Rao, was paid nearly $700,000 in bonuses that pushed his salary up to nearly three million bucks. Now, I ask the everyday Australian out there, how is your MBN going? Good? Is it worth nearly three million dollars by the guy who's running the gig? I don't think so. So while everyday people are struggling, these fat cat executives on the public payroll, in government-owned corporations, are raking it in. Now we've seen the polite letters written by the ministers, uh, the shareholder ministers to both Australia Post and MBN Co. But I say this: put the pen down and take some actual action. We actually need caps on these bonuses and salaries and to start installing public expectations of the wages, Thank you, salaries Senator and bonuses. Hanson Young. Your time has expired. The question is that the motion moved by Senator McKim be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against no. I think the aunt. Ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells.
the doors. The question is that the motion moved by Senator McKim be agreed to. All of that's opinion say aye. Those against? I'll put it again. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the noes have it. Oh, sorry, we're past that part. <laughs> so I'm going to appoint Senator, um, Senator Scar for the noes, and it looks like Senator McKim for the ayes. The result of the division is eyes 10, nose 25. The question is resolved in the negative.